Hey traders, David Frost, My Strategic Forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Thursday, March 11, 2021. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. Should we discuss the thing? What thing? The elephant in the room, the 800 pound gorilla, the new highs, that's the thing. So here's the deal, go back, to the previous videos, you're gonna love this one by the way. Go back to the previous videos and remember, if they close at a new all-time high, 394.17, then I will have been wrong. I told you you're gonna love that one. That's the technical answer. However, the reality answer, the I'm a guy, you're a guy, you're a girl, you're a whatever, the man-to-man, man-to-woman answer is, I never thought that they would make a new high. So I was wrong about that, period, full stop. You're gonna find this hard to believe, but I've been wrong before. However, here's the way we're gonna look at this. We're gonna take this in pieces. Let's talk about the big picture, and then let's talk about the little picture. The little picture starts like this. They made a high the third week in February, and they sold off for about three weeks. But that wasn't the high that I intended. That's not what I was talking about. We'll get back to the little picture after the big picture. The big picture is that the market's gonna go into a corrective state for a prolonged period of time, more than three weeks. That's still on the table. I thought the market would make a high the third week in February. It did make a high. I thought that was going to be the high. Maybe it is from a we didn't close above it yet type of perspective, and maybe it's not. That's not really important right now. The market is where it is, so we've got to address what's in front of us. Has anything changed from the big picture perspective? And the answer, believe it or not, is no. Can today's candle be a tail? Can it be a reversal in the making? And the answer is, from a chart perspective, no. Think about it like this. The trend is your friend until she dumps you. We know all that. So that's the dominant thing. So the uptrend is intact on all timeframes, obviously. They just peaked their head up above a former high. That's not easy to do. They didn't close above it on the first run. Is that anything that we need to be concerned with if you're bullish? And the answer is no, it's not because that's normal garden variety market behavior to be testing a spot first, not being able to bust through the spot. Maybe they have to work through, maybe they pull back, maybe they go sideways, but to bust through former highs on the first run after a gap up from not really too close by, it's just not the norm. What happened today is more of the norm. Something else that's definitely worth mentioning. So we still have decreasing volume on the daily chart. Couple of words, and I wanna reiterate a couple of things on volume and decreasing volume or light volume. That doesn't mean the market's going down. I know a lot of folks believe that, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. The market's been going up on light volume since 2009 for the most part with sabbaticals of corrections along the way. But it's been a light volume tape the entire time. So the market can certainly continue to march higher on light volume, but the reason why I bring it up is because of the flip side. If we had institutional participation and tremendous volume on this, what seemed to be this morning as a breakout move, we would have no choice but to look at it differently, meaning the start of another leg higher. It may be the start of another leg higher, but that's not what the volume is telling us. There's a whole lot of other things that go into the soup, but just in terms of volume, the volume is not telling us this was a blast off with institutional participation driving volume and price higher at the same time. That's not what we had. So it's of note, and that's all. By the way, what happens if the market never closes at a new high and it does go down from here? Well, then I would have been technically correct, emotionally wrong. Something else that I should bring up because it certainly applies here. The market's job is to make as many traders and investors look like fools as much of the time as possible. The market is also known as a frustration mechanism. Let's just say hypothetically, this is the psychology behind some of this stuff. 
let's just say hypothetically, whether it's tomorrow or sometime next week, the market all of a sudden starts going down and this was a fake out breakout type of move. Here's what will have happened in the event that that does happen. On hand number one, they will have forced a lot of traders who were short the market to cover, hence they got squeezed out or got pies in the face. And by the time they turn the market, they'll already have most people believing already the market's never going to go down, the Fed's behind the tape, they're never going to let anything bad happen, buy the dips, period. Once people give up on the downside and only believe in the upside, that's when the market typically leaves them holding the bag. It doesn't let them in on the downside, which they were in before, but now they miss the move. And then you know what happens next. They get in the move late. And by the way, I say they, it's you, it's me. I've done it many of times. You think you're missing the move, so you try and hop in late. What happens next? You get in at an interim low. Then the market rips your face off rally up north. They whip you out of the trade, and then they hit it again, leave you holding the bag. You're left without the trade. Not only were you right, you were left out of the trade, but you lost money. It's a trifecta. I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it. Simple numbers on the daily chart. The old high at, what was it again, up at the high, 394.17. Getting above hourly, closing hourly, closing daily above that, they're going to continue to push higher up into no man's land. Then we don't have a point of reference in terms of resistance, so we have to then wait. And pretty much that's where the market leaves us now. We have to wait for the market to signal, to throw out a sign or signal of a trend change. That's the stuff found in the course, Lazy E-Mini Trader. And that, once again, will give us something to trade against. What does that mean? What that means is if the market gives you a signal, whatever the high of that day was, would be something to trade against. If the market then trades above, closes daily above that high, then the trade was wrong, but you have a point of reference. You know where you're wrong. You're able to lose what? You got it. You're able to lose small and fast if you have to lose at all. Inside the numbers, the pre-market commentary is pretty self-explanatory. Wake up green, they're pushing and pretty close to the all-time highs. Down in three weeks, back up in five days. That's normal garden variety market behavior. And I say that completely tongue-in-cheek. Here's something interesting that's kind of an of-note thing, and we'll watch to see what happens. But today is really when the futures roll. What does that mean? It means that we go from trading in the March futures contract in the ES, for example, into the June contract. They go on a quarterly basis. So there's four contracts that get traded per year. And now we go into the June contract, which is the M contract. And the only thing that I want to mention is weird stuff happens around the roll. Not every time, but sometimes. In fact, more often, a lot of the time. Is today part one of that weird stuff? Well, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but there's nothing you can do about it. It's just something that's in the back of my mind when they roll contracts, weird stuff happens. All of a sudden, a lot of points get realized in a short period of time, and then you look back and you say, ah, oh, they rolled from one contract to another, and all of a sudden I remember weird stuff happens when they roll the contracts. That's it. All right, so we're moving along. Early thoughts. We've got a floater on our hands. They're doing it again. Doing what? Lulling traders to sleep. They're now approaching one of the spots identified in last night's video. This is early in the morning, and what's interesting is the numbers are still the numbers. Regardless of whether they did something that we're surprised at or not surprised at, the numbers are still the numbers. So let me scroll up at the rest of this uh, early thoughts. You'll remember that the number was 392 and a quarter, give or take. You'll see it show up again here as the morning rolls on. 392 and a quarter, 392.50, up in that area. Here's a 15 minute chart. Here's where today's activity starts early this morning at 415. And you can see what happened. They gap right up to the spot that was the prize yesterday. Remember, it was the prize. Now they're running up there early in the morning and they're hanging out all morning long, doing what? Building energy to push higher. We're moving right along. Now right out of the chute, 932, closing candles above 392.50, opens the door for 394. Obviously, I'm paying attention all morning long. 
They're doing the prize from yesterday. They didn't gap over it at the open, but they gapped pretty much right on it. Between you, me, and the lamppost, at that point in the morning, unless we see an imminent failure, it's like they're standing on the table with a megaphone saying, hey, we're going higher yet again. That was the duck. Again, the duck is using the 80-20 rule. 80% of the time, the same stuff happens over and over and over again. Nothing different. 20% of the time, the different happens. And that's the surprise. It's the stuff you don't expect. It's the loss. It's the wrong trade. It's the 80-20 rule. In light of the fact that you pretty much know what happened, and pretty much since 932, we said closing candles above 392.50 opens the door for 394, you know what happened. They did that. They went to 394. They're doing the thing. Some traders are able to buy a breakout. Some are not. It's not easy to do. It's not easy to buy high and sell higher. It's just not for everybody. We're moving along. Pause the video. Read the notes. Double check the work. But you pretty much know what happened today. The market made a high above that. It made a high around 395. It spiked it by 10 points, 10 S&P handles or so. And then it came back in to close below the former high. What about stocks on the move? Well, once again, we're getting a gap up in the morning. It takes away some of the opportunity of stocks that are headed to a destination down south. And when we're in an uptrend, we want to buy stocks that are headed to a destination down south because there's a pretty fair chance that at some point they're going to find support and go back in the other direction. Sometimes they hang out for a cup of coffee, but most of the time, and you'll find this out again today, most of the time they find support and they go back in the other direction. The one that hit its objective today was Oracle. One opened below a number, never got to the second, and the others never got their period, they're off the table. By the way, Cloudera is the one that opened below the first number you can see here, and it just went sideways all day long, only to rally back slightly above it, not much, and close slightly below it by the end of the day. It tells us the number's important, that gives us confidence that we're doing things right, but it just didn't work out, so it opened below, it's off the table. Good. Rather not be in that trade anyway. Didn't do anything. On the contrary, Oracle was a trade that worked out. 66.68, entry number one. 65.87, entry number two. We found the support zone. They rallied the stock. Traders got paid. The numbers work. Wasn't a rocket ride. It was a slow grind. Doesn't matter. You got paid to wait. Paint by numbers, very little pain involved in this stock as they tried to find a low. Once they reversed, that was it. There were two types of trades that happened in Oracle today, by the way. One is the trader that bought the first price did not buy the second price because it didn't come into it in a straight shot. They played around with it for a while and then they came into it. So some traders might have shied away from that. So they might have only had one position or half a position never bought the second, then it turned around anyway, and they got paid either way. The second one was the trader that bought the second price anyway. Their average was less. Their average was about 66 and a quarter, and they got paid more. It was just the way it worked out. Can't buy WM. Uptrend is your friend. Obviously, we know all that. New highs, closing high, closing at the highs. Nothing wrong with this chart. You have to just move it along. Same thing goes for the folks down at the transportation department. So the two favorite market leading indicators, IWM and the transports at new highs, tremendous charts. The head scratcher is still the cues. Now we understand the top heaviness because it's overweighted in only a handful of stocks. However, look at the cues. They haven't even retraced two thirds of the move down. However, they were rejected at the convergence of these two moving averages. This chart is in a totally different position than all the others. It's hard to say that one of them, meaning just comparing the SPY and the Qs, it's hard to say one of them is wrong because the market, whatever market we're discussing, whether it's the Qs or the SPY, the market is always right, but this is a divergence that won't stay like this for long. So we know about divergences. One way or the other, either the Qs are going to continue to rally, and whether or not they make new highs is irrelevant, but if they're going to catch up to what the SPY or the S&P 500 is doing and the Dow is doing, they're going to have to rally. Or 
the others are going to roll over. Where will the cues really get my interest? Interest in what? Interest in going a lot higher. That would be a close above 324 and chain. Exactly 324.33. Above this breakdown candle high, and I realize there's another one coming right behind it, but above this breakdown candle high puts them back above the moving averages, above that real breakdown spot where the market really collapsed, and that will essentially be a repair job. XLF, down a few pennies today, nothing gained, nothing lost, it doesn't really matter, it's a flat day. They're around the all-time highs, they poke their head above to make a new all-time high, so we can't make heads or tails out of this one way or the other, we simply move it along. Smash Mouth. Now this looks very similar to the Q chart we just looked at. Same story, so obviously you can see tech within the tech sector is struggling. So when you see that, you have to go into the stocks that are in the Qs, the stocks that are in the SMH, and you have to look at them, and you have to say, hey, what's the longer term chart look on these symbols? You have to look at the market within the market. What's driving the tape? So for example, Let's bring up the largest holding represented in the queues, which is Apple. At present, it's over 11% of the queues. It's below three out of the four moving averages, at least the ones I follow. Now we're near making new highs, still struggling. Even today, yesterday, didn't really catch a real rally. Why aren't they buying Apple? Isn't Apple supposed to be a leader, a market leader? Why isn't the market leader leading? Maybe it's a sector rotation. Maybe it's a shift in leadership. Either way, you have to ask yourself, one of the widest held names by mutual funds, by index, all that stuff is not leading the tape, yet the tape is going higher anyway. Something is awry. Second largest holding coming in at about 9.5% is Microsoft. Microsoft's not too bad. When you look at the weekly chart, there's nothing wrong with the weekly chart. It's trending higher above all the moving averages. So there's nothing wrong with this. So Microsoft is essentially a participant in the rally. Staying on the weekly chart, we look at Amazon not making new highs, not terrible, but certainly struggling. So why aren't the institutions piling into Amazon while there's money piling into the market? Tesla makes up 4% of the queues. Big culprit why the queues came down. Tesla came down a lot. Google, nothing wrong with Google near the all-time highs, nothing wrong with this chart, other than the fact that it's too far away or extended from home base, the 20 period moving average, but other than that, there's nothing wrong with this chart. We'll do one more here. Facebook represents over 3% of the queues. Obviously not making new highs, it's not terrible, but it's not great. In other words, you're making lower highs. Why is that? Back to the queues. It's good to look at all the charts inside the queues, but all the charts, or at least the ones we looked at, don't really explain why there's such a divergence between the tech sector in the queues against the SPY or the Dow or the Russell. We'll find out later, but something is going on underneath the hood. Either way, we got what we got. And by the way, have I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you? Without you, these videos are not possible. That is true and accurate information. We're going to pull the ripcord here today. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.